Hi, I'm Gary Berman, host of the Unsung Cyber Hero Adventures podcast. Our mission is to shine the light on the unsung heroes who keep us safe online while at work, home, and school. I am the least likely person to be interviewing some of the world's top people in cybersecurity community and beyond, including thought leaders from large enterprises, small and medium businesses, vendors, law enforcement, the government, academia, and others with the goal of humanizing cybercrime. Why? Well, here's my origin story. I started a marketing research and consulting company, and after 10 years, I was able to sell 49% to a global company. Things were going great. And then it happened, right under my nose. A trusted insider and tech contractor essentially cloned my company, spoofed my website, redirected incoming calls to their company, and even pretended to be whistleblowers by calling my biggest clients and saying there was fraud in my data collection operation, and that I was investigation under the FBI and to stop all communications. Well, after a long battle, I lost everything. And it wasn't just me. I had to close the company and lay off my staff. Well, to make a very long story short, I was unable to receive justice due to the lack of attribution. I learned as time passed that being a victim was just exhausting and not unique. So I decided to pivot to become an advocate, to turn my experience into something that would be helpful to other people. But what next? I needed a crash course on the basis of cybersecurity. So I ordered a copy of Cybersecurity for Dummies and after 10 pages, I was lost. That's when I realized there had to be a better way to distill complicated cybersecurity into something that business people and everyone would understand and enjoy. Not only those people in tech and cybersecurity. Then I watched Spider-Man at the movies and that's when it hit me, superhero comics. My goal was to convert blinded real life stories into engaging and empowering stories and animations. The Cyberhero Adventures, Defenders of the Digital Universe was born. Well, having decided on the medium of superhero comics, where was I gonna get the stories? Conferences, it turns out there were a hundred of them. So I began to attend every one that I could. I've also written many articles in my role as a cybersecurity reporter for Cyber Defense Magazine. And that's how I met today's special guest. Richard Henderson from Last Line and Mario Vuxon from Reversing Labs. Hey, Richard, tell us your origin Howdy. story. Thanks for having me, Gary. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, my origin story is not um, a short one, so I'll try and be as brief as possible. But I've been in tech for about 20 years now, cybersecurity for just over a decade. Um, I'm an electronics nerd, a ham radio dork. Um, I teach at DEF CON. Um, I've taught at DEF CON the last few years. I run a contest at DEF CON around ham radio. Um, I'm currently head of threat intelligence at Lastline. Previous to that, I was um, um, field CTO uh, for a small post-quantum cryptography startup. I did six plus years at network security vendor Fortinet. Um, I had a long stint as a database administrator and systems administrator and before that um, some basic IT consulting work. So I've been all over the place. Uh, Vancouver, British Columbia is where I call home. And um, it's great to be here. You know, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed, Richard, in my listening and learning to so many great people uh, like you and unsung heroes is you're all humble. Um, but I know that, um, you know, you've dedicated um, your whole career to helping keep pe keeping people safe online. So I just wanted to say on behalf of the digital universe, thank you for what you do. Appreciate it. So speaking of thanks, hey, Mario, what's your origin story? Hey, Gary. Um, well, so for me, sort of, I guess, you know, the story is also sort of, you know, longer and I'll, you know, try to make it shorter and make it sort of more concise, you know, but uh, I've been focused on security for you know, a number of years. It's actually started for me, well, I'd say probably almost 20 years ago. Uh, it's a company named Groove Networks. Um, it was um, sort of the first encrypted peer-to-peer -peer communications uh, uh, company, uh, simple that client, you know, agent that, you know, effectively uh, became um, a messaging platform. So instant messaging, messaging uh, technology that was actually used uh, in Iraq, you know, as a sort of, you know, safe peer-to-peer -peer communications uh, uh, method, you know, at a time where there was really no security in uh, uh, instant messaging. So that sort of got me uh, attracted to, you know, just looking at, you know, the, 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 uh, the 
cryptography, looking at the uh, safety uh, and sort of the security side, you know, of uh, uh, computing. Uh, and, you know, as the company was very, very advanced, so think of it, you know, the company was founded by Ray Ozzy, and after we were acquired, you know, he succeeded um, um, Bill Gates, you know, on, on the, you know, as a chief software architect at uh, Microsoft and was, you know, sort of behind building up uh, the uh, uh, Azure uh, infrastructure. Uh, a lot of things we were working on were really, really big. And so when I left, you know, Microsoft, I was looking for, uh, a company with, uh, you know, really big, crazy ideas. And so I found Bit9, uh, where I sort of pitched something that they themselves didn't believe was possible, and that's sort of, you know, building a, a very large whitelist uh, database, actually tracking the known elements at the time where most uh, uh, AV vendors were really tracking the polymorphic, you know, malware, uh, packing content, writing lots of signatures and just trying to figure out how they're going to stay alive. This is way uh, before uh, machine learning and any other uh, techniques, you know, that would make uh, uh, agents, you know, elegant, you know, and, you know, fast moving. So uh, that was really, really interesting, but we were pretty much tracking things, you know, uh, uh, hash wise based sort of the cryptographic uh, uh, measurement, you know, for uh, uniqueness, you know, of an object, but really nothing more. Uh, when me and my co-founder started uh, reversing labs, uh, we were very much interested in doing more with this, you know, binary universe. First of all, we were really unhappy how people were looking, uh, uh, looking at, you know, malware, how they were investigating, what they were finding inside. Uh, but you know, more importantly, we really realized that you know, no one was, you know, particularly focused on the binary part of the world. And just think of it, you know, Google today indexes. Uh, uh, which one would call really the text universe. Yes, you know, they do sometimes, you know, deal with binary things. After all, they have, you know, YouTube to deal with images, but the true binary world is the other half of the world. And I, I know Richard will have, you know, a lot to say about, you know, sort of, you know, the, the, the uh, 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 boutique, unusual objects, you know, that, you know, both of our organizations are seeing in the wild, but really, you know, for the most of the planet, you know, the other half of the, of the uh, internet is really binary content that does not get uh, uh, inspected. Think of it, these are really the oceans, you know, to the uh, text-based uh, uh, land masses uh, that, you know, we need to inspect. Now, what this really sort of, you know, led us, you know, to do is, you know, to start, you know, investigating all kinds of different, you know, binary uh, components. Uh, uh, we really uh, told ourselves that we need to focus on things that, antivirus and existing technologies are not focusing on, and that's sort of effectively anything that's outside of the Windows executables is, are the things that, you know, typical technologies don't do really well with. So in, you know, in reversing lab sense, anything that's large, anything, you know, 200 megs, you know, going into the tens of, you know, uh, gigabytes is something that maybe you look at. But then we also look at those, you know, strange nooks and crannies, you know, of uh, uh, file formats, you know, that, are uh, highly boutique, highly unusual. Think of it, uh, you know, financial transactions if you're a financial company. Uh, think of it, healthcare formats if you're in a healthcare business. But then more importantly for the rest of us would be all those other document formats that your typical solution uh, supports. Uh, you know, people think that, you know, Microsoft Office supports maybe, you know, four or five file formats, but because they need to support all sorts of legacy objects, you really, dealing with uh, 40, 50 or more uh, common uh, file formats that will all have a typical uh, icon, something easy to click, you know, and, you know, work with. None of those things tend to get, you know, properly uh, uh, analyzed. And this is sort of that binary realm that, you know, we uh, uh, wanted to uh, address. Well, you said a number of incredibly important things there. And, and one of the words that, that um, you know, just as a marketing communications person, um, in, you know, which is my background, that I would never associate it with technology is the word elegant. Um, Richard, tell me a little bit about, you know, how the, the thought process, the, the creativity, you know, the elegance, the solutions, the having to imagine, you know, what, what, what Mario just said, how do you translate that, you know, into uh, solutions to keep people safe? 
it's not an easy task, that's for sure. Um, um, a big part of it is the translation of the complicated things that Mario has described rather eloquently into ways that the average person can understand. Um, if, you know, to go back to what Mario talked about, about the, you know, the, the dozens upon dozens of um, file formats that, for example, Microsoft Office uses. I mean, there was, um, there was an attack that I think um, some research to Checkpoint uh, articulated a couple months ago about uh, the BIF file, uh, file format, binary interchange file format. It's an old Excel format from the 90s. And these um, people behind the Adwin Trojan used BIF to um, launch an attack, knowing full well that there was a large number of modern antivirus scanners that ignore BIF because it's been deprecated by Microsoft for well over 15 years. So how do you, how do you explain that? to someone, how do you build that into your technology? How, how, how can you explain it in a way that um, John and Jane Q public sitting at a desktop just doing their work from day to day can really understand? It's, there's, there's no silver bullet when it comes to this stuff. So, so the, the, the solution you know, in, in part is, I think Mario was alluding to it a little bit as well, is embracing this, this, this new reality of machine learning and artificial intelligence when it comes to cybersecurity and having you know, the complicated, non-elegant things offloaded to all these machines to do all the work for you. And, you know, one of the other words, Mario, that you just talked about, which which is not something that, you know, I would associate, you know, with cybersecurity, um, but makes complete sense, nooks and crannies. Like, can you give uh, our audience an example of, of, of what that is and, and maybe even a use case of, of how uh, criminals, um, you know, would, would find these nooks and crannies and exploit them? Um, absolutely. So, absolutely. So, you know, if you want to stay with sort of, you know, the, the, the simple, the, the Microsoft Office uh, paradigm, I mean, we can definitely move, you know, further, is, you know, you're dealing with, you know, I mean, we all deal with software, be it Microsoft Office, be it Windows operating system, be it Linux, uh, be it, you know, Mac OS that, you know, have been around for many, many years. In that period, specifications of how we structure binary payloads, and binary payloads, is, you know, for most people, it's it's files. Financial transactions could be saved as you know files, you know, per se. Uh, they could, at top level, be some kind of an archives, you know, compressed. But inside will be usually sort of a, something that you know is well understood. It has the header. It says who who I am in binary, not you know legible text has offsets, you know, and then eventually there's like interesting payloads and coded, compressed, encrypted, whatever, you know, uh, all, you know, line, lined up uh, everywhere. Now, through history, and, you know, history is really for some companies monthly, if not quarterly releases, uh, changes. And so you effectively need to follow up, you know, what human was able to uh, invent, what human was able to break, because, you know, we should also assume that, you know, not everything that was uh, envisioned, you know, was uh, implemented the way uh, uh, it had to be, that there was no malicious activity. And of course, I mean, there's uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, motivations, you know, for failures, for breakages, you know, from uh, deliberate to, uh, 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 you know, unwanted, uh, that, you know, convert into the products that are not correctly documented, that are not correctly parsed, that, you know, uh, uh, break, you know, for the purpose that they were built for. Uh, that's even before the uh, malicious users, you know, get to studying them and in and then using them for either malicious activity, exploitation, or such. Uh, unfortunately, this generates, you know, this sort of almost chaotic um, um, combination of infinite infinite possibilities, so that uh, defender really needs to study all the possible ways, you know, that the content could be transmitted, uh, that it was designed, could be broken through, throughout its history. And therefore, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, the history of computing provides a beautiful, a beautiful surface on which, you know, the attacker could uh, 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 learn and hone their techniques, you know, for exploitation. You know, uh, Richard, one of the things that I've listened and learned a great deal about is this um, at least historical difference in the way that black hat hackers behave versus white hat hackers in that a black hat hackers through various uh, 
uh, dark web or deep web, you know, um, uh, ways of sharing information, you know, readily share their exploits, you know, and, and readily share their information where, where, you know, sort of the good guys, uh, you know, generally speaking, have, have not, although I understand, you know, that's getting, you know, a lot better. You know, why is that? And, and most importantly, what is the next step in information sharing? you know, to even further amplify the solutions and, and the defenses? So that's a lot of question, right? Um, so let's start with the black hat stuff. Um, first of all, I don't, I don't like the term white hat and black hat only because I think every white hat in the world is a little gray at one point in their life, whether they they were a much younger and much more irresponsible person and did things maybe they shouldn't have or just, you know, got a little mischievous. Um, I, I don't know anybody who's a true white hat who's never done anything that could be considered, considered at least gray. So whatever. Um, why do people on the black side of things um, share things like exploits and things that they've done? Um, a big Part of it is establishing credibility amongst their peers. Um, we all want that, especially as younger people. We all want to be seen as someone who's knowledgeable and, and elite, for lack of a better term. Um, so, so that drives a lot of, of the sharing. The other, the, uh, um, to distill that down even a little further is that the more credibility that you build on that side of the world, the, the easier and easier it becomes to um, um, make money. Um, a lot of these people on that side of the fence are doing this to make a lot of money, and many of them are making a lot of money. So the more credibility you have, the more likely you're going to find um, lesser skilled people in that world who are going to want to contract you to help them develop exploits or or um, purchase the exploit kits that you've created for them to use. Um, so so it ultimately boils down to two things, credibility and money. Now on the white side, white hat side, whatever we want to call it, the vendor side, the friendly side, the good side. Um, you're right. In the past, there hasn't been a heck of a lot of cross-pollination when it comes to sharing things. And on the public safety side, um, there's, a, there's a perfect um, analogy here. We saw what happened September 11th. And a big portion of what happened is September 11th is the fact that all these federal agencies in the United States weren't sharing intelligence with each other. And if maybe they had, they might have been able to put the dots together. I don't know if, if it would have stopped it or not, but it doesn't matter. Um, so a lot of these people, a lot of these vendors in the past have held on to the information that they, they gleaned from whatever sources they can get them from because they feel it gives them a competitive advantage. can say, um, you know, Company A has all this information, but Company B does it. So why would you want to buy something from Company B when you can get all that from us at Company A? Um, it's starting to be seen that there's a lot more benefit in sharing that information. We're starting to see that around the COVID um, outbreak, that there's a, a number of groups that have uh, banded together to share intelligence, uh, share the things that they're doing in order to protect all their customers. And I've, all, I've been saying this for years, is that you know at the end of the day, all of us cybersecurity people who work for vendors, at the end of the day, we all go home and we all want pretty much the same things for, for all our customers in medicines at a whole. You know, we're just trying to create a safer place for people to, to exist online. Um, I, I think people are starting to understand that um, integration with other vendors, um, whether that means open APIs to allow um, cybersecurity products to integrate uh, more fully, um, it, it is, is going to be a big portion of the way forward. Um, Gartner talks about that a little bit now. They call, they call it the SOC visibility triad. And what that is, is it's the combination of um, SIM and SOAR plus EDR plus now NDR, network detection and response, all being fully integrated with each other and being able to communicate back and forth, share the information these security tools or security appliances are generating. And it's it acts like a force multiplier where, um, um, you get um, an exponentially greater benefit of having these three, three, these three core technologies working better together than it, than it would be if they were working by themselves. Well, I, you know, I love what you just said and how you said it. And coincidentally, I'm working on a character for our comics called the Force Multiplier. And that's exactly his superpower is precisely what you're saying, you know, and and, um, you know, so Mario, I, you know, one of the things that um, we've been hearing an increasing amount of over the last um, maybe couple of years is uh, this notion of bug bounties, 
you know, where, where companies are paying uh, for uh, threat researchers to, um, who discover, you know, either zero day or other vulnerabilities and they're compensating them for them. Do you think that's making a difference in, in uh, trying to keep uh, people, uh, I won't, I, I'll learn from what Richard said, uh, rather using black and white, but, but just moving more towards the helper side of things. Oh, I, you know, absolutely. I think it makes a lot of, you know, a lot of difference. So uh, from a number of areas. So, you know, from the, from the perspective of, you know, those that, you know, are effectively providing the, you know, free or, you know, discounted labor uh, testing, product testing, you know, for organizations is a huge, uh, huge value. Uh, also, it's, uh, you know, we really need to come up with, uh, with, with a market where, you know, security research and uh, security uh, uh, products, you know, uh, are, you know, appropriately uh, compensated, you know, for, you know, their quality. And then also the people that are involved, you know, can find themselves uh, uh, in uh, staying uh, with the discipline uh, as a kind of their uh, profession uh, long term. So historically, uh, I mean, historically, everybody was, a, uh, 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 in, you know, for a, I guess, you know, lack of a better color, like, you know, uh, underground, sort of, you know, black in a sense, you know, meaning, you know, uh, working in basements, you know, at home, uh, really in initial security researchers were the hobbies. They were doing it because they liked it for their own reasons. And, you know, a lot of that knowledge, a lot of the experimentation would usually go away as soon as they figured out that they need to find a job uh, uh, to survive. So, I think there's a, there's a great, uh, uh, you know, sort of the, the community aspect of, you know, bug bounty uh, uh, programs, but also uh, it's, a, it's a great, you know, uh, teaching tool, you know, for uh, enterprises, you know, themselves, um, so that, you know, they have something, you know, as a reference point to teach, you know, in a sort of you know, non-confrontational uh, way, the management, the other parts of the organization, the values of, uh, uh, quality uh, product development. You know, and and also, you know, speaking of teaching, Richard, you know, you you you're a you're a very well uh, regarded and uh, uh, thought leader in, in terms of teaching. You you taught at DEF CON and many of the places. And you know, what, what's your primary motivation for for giving back in that way? Um, so. Um, I forgot to mention, I also serve in the Canadian Army part-time as a reservist, as a signaler. So I spend a lot of time um, sharing some of the things I know about radio with a lot of people there. Um, but what, here's the easiest way for me to articulate that question is that I really feel like I know nothing in this, this business. I feel like I know nothing in this world. Um, and the fact that I know some very small things that other people find are useful and worth them taking some time out of their, their lives to learn from me is incredibly flattering. Um, so why wouldn't I want to share the, the, the small, um, you know, um, piece of the world that I, that I know a little bit about with people who are interested in learning about it. Um, I don't want to say I'll feel obliged to share, but, um, I almost do. And it's, um, incredibly humbling to think that I can stand in front of a room of a hundred people for four or eight hours at a time and teach them something. And, and most of them leave um, saying that they learned something and they, they just can't wait to get home and, and try out the things that they've, they've learned from me is um, it's an amazing feeling. So um, I often say this as well. I, if I didn't have a mortgage and I didn't have a kid and I didn't have a spouse, I would do this job for free. Um, I wouldn't even think twice about it. So what's keeping you up at night regarding the current state of, of cybersecurity, Mario? Uh, well, I mean, so to me, sort of the, 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 the craziest sort of the uh, um, development, you know, and which is something that certainly was in motion, you know, throughout the last year, but uh, the current crisis, the COVID crisis certainly accelerated, was, you know, the, uh, the movement, you know, among the ransomware uh, uh, gangs, you know, to move towards the steal and leak, you know, type of a uh, type of a model. Uh, I think because everybody's sort of working from home these days, the value of uh, uh, infecting you and then hoping to get to the other relevant servers in an environment to encrypt all of their data is a lot more difficult proposition than it used to be. So effectively, 
Most people have taken their laptops home. They have a VPN connection, which in general is well protected, you know, from sort of, you know, typical uh, lateral movement, you know, elements. So what we are seeing, you know, in majority uh, uh, is, you know, the data actually not just being encrypted, but being stolen uh, uh, and uh, uh, threatened to be leaked, you know, online. And so, I mean, presumably for a lot of the personal data, it's sort of, you know, it's up to the individual user. Do they really care? They're going to pay up, you know, if their private photos and whatever documents, you know, end up, you know, online. But because, you know, generally organizations uh, uh, allow users, you know, to have access to sensitive data, you know, through, through a VPN, whether for right or wrong, the, the organizations and employees uh, have, you know, uh, sufficient amount, you know, concerned so that, you know, they will play the ball, you know, with, you know, some of these players. Oh, that's interesting. I, I've heard uh, arguments on both sides from the FBI itself about whether or not mm -hmm. you to, to, to pay. And I guess it boils down to an individual, you know, cost benefit analysis of a particular organization. You take something like healthcare. I mean, which sectors of the economy, Richard, do you think are the most vulnerable to, to cyber attack now? Um, just to touch on Mario's uh, answer there for a second, I um, am amazed we haven't seen another iCloud photos, massive celebrity type breach that we saw a few years back, um, especially around the ransomware stuff, the steal and leak. I can't believe someone hasn't managed to break into someone's, uh, a major provider's um, confidential uh, stuff and, and just leak it out for the sake of doing it. Um, or if they have, they're likely monetizing because, you know, yeah. there is a precedent and there is, yeah. you know, hey, you know, you know, people, yeah. people know that if they pay, maybe, you know, if uh, we'll keep it confidential. And You're so right. Likely. It probably has happened. Yep. And they just paid to keep it quiet. Um, we may never know. Um, but what other sectors do I think are ripe for um, attack? Um, healthcare, obviously, in this, this state of flux that we're in, this state of, I don't want to say panic, but this state of very unsettled times, uh, have a big fat target on their back. Um, eventually, somebody in a, some faraway land is going to decide that this, this, this truce that they've decided to call on healthcare is going to end because they found a way in that's going to cause a huge, huge, huge problem. And they're going to figure they can make a couple hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, a couple million dollars off taking something down. And um, that's what they're going to do. Um, I think the energy sector in the West um, has been slow to move forward um, in the strengthening of their non-IT assets. Um, um, the first um, stuff we started to see you know, quite a few years ago was just uh, people selling solutions to these utility type companies where they just bolted on connectivity to, to devices that were never designed to ever see a public IP address space. And um, you have hardware level access to a lot of these things. Um, so why haven't we seen big problems in the power grid yet? I think it's, um, I think it's, it's, I don't want to say it's an, it's, it's a win, um, but um, um, people really need to pay attention. Um, I think um, um, all these people working from home during the COVID crisis has probably put a big fat target on the backs of payment processors and, and banks and, and people that are moving money around just because there's so much more of it moving around online these days. Like look how far behind Amazon is filling orders for people. They have seen online shopping volumes unprecedented. I, I've read stories that like most online retailers think it's like, it's like the month, it's like December, it's like Christmas every single day right now. And they're just struggling to keep up. This would be a perfect opportunity for someone to 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 attack a place like that and hopefully get away without being seen. Um, um, but at the same time, um, I think everybody is still a target for 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 the main reason that um, um, we still make it really really easy for attackers to succeed in 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 technology um doesn't matter what vertical you're in the spray and pray model for a lot of attackers still continues to pay dividends for them um they um they're going to continue to do so while they can continue to make money and they're continuing to make lots of money so why wouldn't you know you don't you don't fix what's not broken right if you're going to make lots of money just just hitting random targets because you get lucky why would you stop doing that until you have to hmm. 
Well, I'd say that anything that's, uh, you know, Gary, I would say anything with, 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 with lights on is, is really target, which means that there's a lot of things that, are, that don't have lights on, sort of, you know, mom and pop shops, you know, SMBs, restaurants, you know, organizations that would have been for a lot of the, uh, you know, cyber criminals, you're not talking about, you know, state sponsored actors, those would be their primary uh, targets. And, you know, they are really you know, struggling to redirect you know their attacks you know towards uh, and so you see a lot of the covid targeted stuff you know towards work from home etc uh you know taking advantage of the energy sector that's uh, that's a tall order i mean unless you're in a state sponsored actor and, and have ulterior motives getting money from some of these organizations is not trivial and that was a problem last year just the same it is probably now yeah, I mean, uh, I wonder uh, what, what your opinions are, you know, both of you um, about the notion of the degree of difficulty to take down, you know, the electrical grid, because I've heard, um, you know, from some people that it's very hard because it's a distributed network and, and kind of disjointed in that way. But I've heard from other people uh, that, you know, for example, the test that was done in the Ukraine, you know, seems to have worked. I think just like in any, you know, the 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 sort of the uh, criminal uh, TV series, you know, you always start with the motive. So why would you want to do it? What's the what's the end game goal, you know, for the attacker? And so if there is a meaningful end game goal and they have the capability to do it, you know, then something we should certainly worry be worried about. And I think infrastructure uh, threats, you know, have been a big thing, you know, that we as a nation worried about for the last I don't know how many years. Hmm. So. Let me just start with two seconds on this, Gary. Um, I agree with what Mario said. Motive and intent is really important here, but um, it's not just state sponsored groups. I, I highly suspect that most of the, the really good state sponsored groups have studied this at length and they probably have battle plans in place to attack um, an enemy nation's um, infrastructure and grid if it ever came down to it. Um, but it's not happened because obviously that's a pretty big step for an, a nation state attacker to take is to take down the electrical grid of another country. You know, is that tantamount to a declaration of war these days? I mean, these are questions that people far smarter than, than, than me have discussed at length. But um, um, as far as the garden variety, low skill, medium skill, uh, cyber criminals, um, they don't have to take down the actual uh, grid itself. When all they have to do is target the, the accompanying IT assets of, of, a, of a utility target. Um, if you take down the entire computer system through a ransomware outbreak of some you know, Midwest electrical utility of you know, one or two states, does it really make a difference if, if you took the power off as well? You've basically crippled them in just a different way. Yes, the power is gonna still flow, but um, they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to manage things the way they are they're not gonna be able to remotely manage things the way they were doing um and it just throws a big wrench in things and it's just as disruptive as, as them attacking the, the infrastructure themselves wow that's incredibly interesting um you know one of the uh joys of working from home is uh, i just got called by my better half she's asking me to excuse uh, me for just a minute can can you guys uh just ask each other a question and and, and i should be back in just a minute Sure. Mario, what'd you have for lunch? <laughs> I didn't have a lunch yet. <laughs> oh, bad boy. I'll, I'll try to do something else, you know, uh, you know, shortly. Um, so Richard, I guess, you know, before we started, like, you know, you, you were talking about, you know, the, the archive formats and things you were seeing, you know, can yeah. you talk more about that? That seems like a really fascinating angle. So, um, Obviously, I have access to a lot of threat intelligence, being that's part of my job at last line. Yeah. And um, we do a lot of digging around just for interesting uh, snippets of information that might be useful. And um, one of the things I'm talking about now, and in fact, um, as we talked about it before we started, is that um, I just started a new video series with last line um, that takes a little key stat and explains it um, in like two or three minute chunks. And this specific one you're mentioning too is it's really neat. I had no idea until I saw the data. But um, in March, um, so uh, over a month ago now, um, we took a look at all the compressed and archived file formats that were passing across the email of, of um, a large number of customers. Mm -hmm. And over 99%
of all non-zip archiver compression files that came in via email and were analyzed by us contained malicious software or some sort of malicious artifact. Um, that's amazing. Like if you think about it, like there's so many other compressed file formats, you know, you have zip, which everybody knows you have RAR and tar and, you know, um, BZ2 and, zip, you know, yeah. and you have all that stuff. Right. Um, and if it's coming in via email and it's not a zip file, the, it's almost always going to be something malicious. So, so why, why do we see that? Um, one, pretty much everybody's default to zip for compression, except for, you know, developers and Linux users and computer nerds and people like us. Um, the idea there, I think for a lot of these attackers is, is the hope that um, they're gonna come across an email security platform or a network security platform that doesn't scan those types of files. Um, um, the, the lesser known, more obscure file formats, which kind of, you know, alludes to what you talked about earlier, right? You know, these 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 industry specific mm -hmm. file formats aren't scanned by commodity based antivirus, and uh, the hope is that it gets through un unscanned. So, you know, how for how many years have we 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 looked at, for example, lots of sandbox appliances don't scan anything over ten megs or twenty five megs or whatever it is. Um, so, I think they're 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 boring a whole bunch of different little little things to, and and they're putting it all in their playbooks in the hopes that they can squeak something by, in the hopes that somebody will will open it up. Um, okay, Gary, I'll take care of it. Um, um, hello, um, I'm uh, the unsung Gary. Where'd you, Gary? Where'd you go? <laughs> Who's this guy? I, I'm uh, I'm the unsung hero. Uh, Gary had to step away and wanted me to uh, just kind of uh, say thank you for for being uh, real life uh, unsung heroes. He he told me about this uh, cool comic uh, series, of Cyber Who Adventures, Defenders of the Digital Universe, of which uh, he said that I'm a, a little part of, and maybe we'd like to uh, include uh, you in. So. Uh, Gary just wanted me to uh, let uh, the audience know that you can go to cyberheroescomics.com and download these uh, free digital uh, editions of the comic. And uh, that if you want to be uh, on his show, uh, just uh, send an email to uh, Gary at uh, cyberheroescomics.com. And the last thing you wanted to make sure to, uh, to let me know besides saying thank you so much is how does the audience get more information from you? Your name is uh, Richard. Uh, how, Richard, how, how does the audience get more information about the stuff you're doing? Pretty easy. Um, everything about what we're doing at LastLine can be found at lastline.com, or you can reach out to me at rhenderson at lastline.com. I'm always on the Twitters as well, at Rich sent me. Who sent me? Rich sent me. Okay, and uh, your, your name is um, uh, Mario. Uh, hi, Mario. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as uh, well. How do people get more information about uh, reversing labs? In a, in a very, in a very similar uh, way um, as, as Richard just mentioned. So, reversinglabs.com is our website. Uh, Reversing Labs is our you know, Twitter handle, uh, or you can find us on Instagram and LinkedIn. And then, of course, my email is mario at reversinglabs.com. You know, and the last thing you wanted to show uh, was the source of his superpower. These are the the conferences uh, that uh, I guess he might have uh, mentioned. I'm, I'm sure all you all have- The force uh, multiplier, right? Yeah, exactly the force multiplier. Well, with that, um, you know, on behalf of a grateful digital uh, universe, thank you so much for uh, what you do to keep us safe uh, online at work and, and home at, at school. And, and uh, stay safe, stay home. Thank you, thank you. Nice chatting.